Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Today's webinar is Seven Things You Should Consider Before Selecting a Vacuum Gauge. And our presenter is Doug Baker, the Director of Sales and Business Development for Hastings. We will be taking questions throughout the seminar, so feel free to submit those using the question function, and we will address them at the end. Okay, Doug, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Shelley. Uh, hello, and welcome to today's webinar. As Shelley mentioned, it is entitled Seven Things You Should Consider Before Selecting a Vacuum Gauge. My name is Doug Baker, and I am the Director of Sales and Business Development at Teledyne Hastings in Hampton, Virginia, here in the United States. And before we get started, I want to tell you that this is not going to be a salesy presentation. I won't be advocating for a particular technology or product line. We're not going to explore the advantages and disadvantages of various measurement techniques. Rather, I'm going to present several attributes of vacuum gauges, some obvious, some not so obvious, that you may want to consider before you select a particular vacuum gauge. The webinar runs just under 20 minutes, and we'll have time at the end to take questions. The webinar is being recorded. The recording and the slides will be posted in the webinar recording library, which is located on our website. Our website URL is teledyne-hi.com. So let's get started. In today's webinar, we're going to start by briefly reviewing some various vacuum applications. Now, the point here is not to list every single vacuum application that is out there, but we want you to realize that there are many unique situations and there's not a one-size-fits-all vacuum gauge. Next, as we think about all of these different vacuum applications, we're going to dive into the seven things or attributes about vacuum gauges that we're going to consider. I'm sure we could think of more, and you could argue that some of the attributes in the webinar are actually more than one thing to consider, but seven is kind of a lucky number, so we're going to call it that. We will introduce each one at a time, and then spend a couple of slides exploring each. Uh, the webinar will conclude as we give some suggestions about where you can go for help on vacuum gauges and, of course, how to contact our applications engineers here at Teledyne Hastings. Okay, let's start by talking about some vacuum applications. And as I was putting together the slide deck for this webinar, I thought about that farmer's insurance commercial. You know the one. For us, it would go something like, We've seen a thing or two about vacuum applications. Well, what I find interesting, and it, and it makes the job fun, is just how many different environments or situations there are for vacuum measurement. There are indoor installations with highly controlled environments, and then on the other extreme, there are outdoor applications that require rugged sensors that experience extreme temperature variations and must have the ability to withstand demanding shock and vibration conditions. So as you look at our wheel of vacuum, you see different applications that are out there, HVAC charging, uh, semiconductor and photovoltaic processes. Uh, we work in the power generation. Of course, freeze drying is a, is a, it can be a vacuum process, right? Uh, we work with analytical instruments and vacuum metallurgy, uh, biopharmaceutical, and of course, some people uh, use vacuum gauges in calibration environments. Now, Thin film coatings, whether for optical or, or hardening or other application, often demand consistent process control. And uh, on uh, another application, the sensors that we provide to our analytical laboratory instrumentation folks need to be small, reliable, and repeatable. Again, looking at the wheel of vacuum, there's not one size fits all. As we look at some examples of vac vacuum applications, you will realize that there are differences in the pus, uh, pumping systems that are utilized. For example, when it comes to HVAC systems, oil-based pumps uh, are often used and the systems are not especially clean. On the flip side, thin film and semiconductor uh, accelerator vacuum systems uh, should be using oil-free pumps. And of course, the semiconductor applications have some very challenging gas conditions in terms of uh, chemical reactions. Now, different industries are going to have their own methods for dealing with the output of their instrumentation. And although there are some advanced industrial buses, there's still a lot of analog signal handling. Um, RS-232 and 485 is often used as well. We're going to get into some of that uh, later on. Um, but now let's get on to number one on our list, 
and, it, and it's sort of obvious, but I want to chat about it for a minute, and that is range. All of these different applications that we talked about a minute ago, put together, cover a very broad range of pressures. Surface analysis systems and particle accelerators can reach below 1 times 10 to minus 10 torr. And there are some vacuum drying applications that may only require 100 torr. Vacuum measurement covers a broad range of regions and technologies, and there's not one single technique that's going to cover them all. Now, there are combination gauges that will combine techniques to cover a broader range. But as you think about the range that you require, I want you to also I want to also point out that different techniques have a region of pressures where they work best. So Wimbledon's coming up here in a couple of weeks. So we're going to talk about the sweet spot. Just like a tennis racket has a sweet spot, vacuum gauges have a pressure sweet spot where they will give their best performance. In the graph shown, uh, you'll see that a thermal conductivity gauge has about a three order of magnitude sweet spot. Different techniques have different pressure regions where they work best. So yes, you probably can run a hot filament ionization gauge at pressures above, above one times 10 minus 4 torr, but that's not operating in the sweet spot. And when we often see users who try to extend the low end of their measurement, ideally you want to stay well within the operating range, stay in that sweet spot. So you want to ask yourself, what is the critical range of pressure measurement for, for the application? Okay, so as you can imagine, the range selection is going to be very dependent upon number two on our list, which is accuracy. Now, of course, Higher accuracy vacuum gauges are generally going to cost more, so you want to ask yourself, how critical is accuracy to the application? For some applications, vacuum measurement is a matter of go, no go. So during pump down, once the system has gone below a certain pressure, the process can begin. In these cases, accuracy below that level is not really critical. And I want to say one other thing about accuracy. We've met some folks who aren't familiar with vacuum gauging. For example, there are some metrology managers who are very surprised when they find out that a gauge has an accuracy specification of 10% of reading or higher. Vacuum gauges, especially high vacuum gauges, are not like micrometers or electrical meters. I've seen some accuracy specifications for vacuum gauges listed as high as 50% of reading. So be realistic about the spec that you're, you're asking for. Okay, now I'd like to get into another topic. That is the characterization, characterization of gauges as being either direct or indirect. So now let's go back to basics and think about pressure, how it's defined, right? Pressure is defined as force per unit area, right? So think about the units. You have pounds per square inch, force per unit area. And I've shown here, you know, the old mercury column, right, where you have the atmospheric pressure pushing down on the mercury, pushing the column up, and you measure the height of, of the column, 760 millimeters of mercury. Of course, our unit for pressure, the tor, is defined, is, is a millimeter of mercury, right? So now direct gauges are going to measure the force that the gas imparts on some part of the gauge. On the other hand, on the left hand side there, indirect gauges measure pressure by measuring some pressure dependent property of the gas. So this could be something like thermal conductivity or the gas's ionization rate or its viscous drag. So now let's look at some examples of both indirect and direct gauges. Examples of direct gauges where the force of the gas on something is measured directly would be the burden gauge shown here, or you could have a piezo-resistive pressure sensor or a capacitive speedometer. Now, examples of indirect gauges would be thermal conductivity gauges like the thermocouple or prani, the hot filament ionization gauge or the cold cathode gauge. Spinning rotor gauges are also indirect gauges. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is that it's important for users to know that when using indirect gauges, the output is going to depend on the type of gas being used. Now, in the case of direct gauge, the output at a given pressure will be the same no matter what type of gas is being used. So here are a couple of quick examples. Say, take the indicated pressure of argon for a prani gauge, which is a thermal gauge. At a given pressure, 
it's going to be about half the indicated pressure for air. Now, if we look at the case of a hot filament ionization gauge, the indicated pressure for helium is going to be about a factor of five less than that for nitrogen. Now, what does this all mean? Well, if you're going to be changing the gas composition in your system frequently, you need to be aware of how that gas is going to affect the output of the, on, of the gauge. On the other hand, if the gas gas in your system is consistent run to run, for example, you're always pumping out air, well, you can easily get excellent process control with an indirect gauge. Okay, let's move on. How are we going to look at the output of the vacuum gauge? And this is a simple thing we want to explore um, so you know what options are available. It really comes down to three areas. Uh, visual, where you simply look at the gauge and know what the pressure is in your system. Digital output, in which the digital output is going to be connected to a central control module, like a PC, and analog, in which the uh, proportional signal, either voltage or current, is connected to a PLC or DAC card. And before we move on, I should mention that for many gauges, you don't have to simply select one of these things, right? Uh, there are advanced digital vacuum gauges that may offer all three. That is, you can have a display as well as analog and digital outputs. Now, for visual, there are gauges with simple numeric displays. There are also some with graphical display, which can be nice when you want to monitor the system during pump down and vent cycles. Dial gauges with needle movements can be nice because they give the user insight into the pump down rate as the needle moves. And some folks have argued that they can interpret multiple dial gauges faster by glancing up at a control panel, and they instantly know the status of their process. Now, there are several different types of digital outputs that are available. RS-232 is still often selected for its ease of implementation. Uh, now, computers no longer provide that nine-pin serial port on the back, so you either have to use a gauge with an easy USB connection, or there are inexpensive USB to 232 converters. RS-485 is very handy when there are multiple vacuum gauges or additional sensors to monitor in a process or an experiment. RS-485 sensors are usually addressable. Of course, there's that initial challenge of getting the RS-485 all wired up correctly, but once up and running, RS-485 networks are generally very reliable. And there are also industrial uh, buses that are available. You will generally see more acceptance of these in Europe. Vacuum gauges for Profibus, EtherCAT are available, and there are even some wireless instrument, uh, instrumentation that, that are available. And I've got to show one funny graphic that I, I came across while preparing for this webinar. It reads, there are only one zero types of people in the world, those who understand binary and those who don't. Okay, let's move on to analog output. There are two broad categories of choice, choices here, voltage and current. Voltage output can often be linear, where the output is directly proportional to the pressure. You can have 0 to 1, 0 to 5, or 0 to 10 volts DC. And these are generally very easy to wire up and uh, get up and running and use. Current outputs, like uh, 4 to 20 milliamp, are nice because they allow the user to connect over very long distances without losing voltage signal or degradation due to resistance in the cable. 4 to 20 milliamp signals are also less susceptible to electrical noise. Now, where it gets fun is that there are different classifications of 4 to 20 milliamp, right? For example, sensors could be active, i.e., they source current, or passive, sinking. Then there are isolated and non-isolated loops. So you want to think about how you're going to process the 4 to 20 milliamp signal and ensure that your vacuum gauge is compatible. And speaking of analog output, there's one other point I want to make here. That's that a vacuum gauge that's covering many orders of magnitude, say like a combination gauge that goes from atmosphere to 10 minus 4, or a combination gauge that goes from atmosphere to 10 minus 10 tor, uh, cannot have a single linear voltage output. Now think about that for a moment. If you had a full-scale value of 1,000 tor corresponding to 10 volts, and then you would have a 10 minus 4 tor, the output would be only one microvolt. So that's going to be susceptible to noise, and it's going to be a hard measurement to make. So what the... Uh, some gauges do is they provide a logarithmic output. It's then easy to take the voltage measurement 
take the output, combine it with a constant that you, that you get out of the manual, and do the calculation. And of course, you can pop that right into Excel. That makes it easy to convert uh, from voltage uh, to a pressure reading. Okay, let's move on to number five on our list, where we're gonna talk about uh, the environment. Now, this is a very broad category, but I wanted to present a few things that you may want to consider before making a selection. Internal to the vacuum gauge, you'll want to think about material compatibility issues that you might have between the gases you're trying to measure and the wetted materials in the gauge. This is especially important if there are highly reactive or corrosive gases involved in your vacuum process. We also encounter applications that need to be able to withstand high temperatures. And believe it or not, there are some vacuum applications that need to be rated for high pressures. Vacuum sensors for space flight or transportation applications must be able to reliably survive high shock and vibration exposure. If your sensor installation involves an outdoor or washdown environment, make sure your sensor and or your instrument is suitable. Some vacuum environments are gonna involve high electric or magnetic fields. These fields may have an effect on the performance of an ionization-based gauge. And finally, if you're working in a radioactive environment, you probably already know about the long-term effects that radioactivity can have on certain materials uh, used in the instrumentation industry. Okay, let's move on. Consider the size and installation of the vacuum gauge. So most companies will provide outline, outline drawings and step files. Uh, they're available to help you with your system design. Uh, when you're packaging analytical instrumentation, size can be very critical, not just for the gauge, but also for the cabling. Now, if you're working with an oil-based pump, ideally you want to have the port of the gauge facing down. If you're designing for CE approval, you need to think about RF interference. The installation location inside a chassis can have a large effect on the susceptibility of the gauge to RF interference. And now the seventh thing that you will want to consider, obviously, is the price of the gauge. But in addition to the initial purchase, you also want to find out about the cost of ownership. For example, if you're sending the gauge out every six months for calibration, then those costs are going to add up over the years. Okay, quick summary. Here are the seven things to consider before selecting a vacuum gauge. We talked about range, accuracy, indirect versus direct, output, environment, size, and we wrapped up with uh, price and cost of ownership. Now, you don't have to go it alone. There are many resources for you to get help. The American Vacuum Society, or AVS, has a nice technical library online. There are tutorials and papers on best practices, and I'll, I'll point out a couple here. Uh, there's one entitled Vacuum Gauging and Control, there's also the Fundamentals of Vacuum Technology. And the Society of Vacuum Coders, SVC, also has some education guides. There are several books on vacuum science, and some are better than others, especially when it comes to the practical side of vacuum gauging. Uh, one that I like is The Foundations of uh, Vacuum Science. Uh, chapter 6 is dedicated to vacuum gauges, so you might want to check that out. And, of course, you always have access to any of the applications engineers here at Teledyne Hastings. Uh, we love to help you out. Uh, you can call or email us, and we are happy to talk about your vacuum gauge or mass flow controller application. So um, I want to thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, we do have time for some questions. And uh, while we're waiting to see if there are any questions, um, I'll remind you that the recording of the webinar and copies of the slides will be available to you, and they're going to be posted in a few days at www.teledyne-hi.com.